I would like to remind you that for more Microsoft webcasts, you can go to Microsoft.com, WAC webcasts. Thanks again for joining us for today's presentation, MSDN Webcast, What's New with Light Switch and Visual Studio 11. Now it is my pleasure to introduce today's presenter, Beth Massey. Beth, you now have the floor. Thanks so much. Um, welcome, everybody. I'm very excited to talk about um, my favorite product, um, Visual Studio Light Switch, and what's new in Visual Studio 11. Um, my name is Beth Massey. I am a senior program manager on the Visual Studio team. Um, within Visual Studio, I'm on the, what's called the Biz Apps team. We build the tools for Office and SharePoint, um, the Azure tools, as well as Light Switch. So we do basically all the tools around building business applications. So you can find me on the web at www.bethmassey.com, and you follow me on Twitter at Beth Massey. Okay, so I'm going to just share my uh, desktop here. Uh, let's see what you got here. Um, share, because I've got a lot of demos for you all today. Okay, so first I'm going to walk through um, a, a slides on, I'm going to give you kind of an overview of what Light Switch is, just for those of you that aren't familiar with building apps with Light Switch. Um, so what is it? It really, Light Switch is a, a rapid application development environment it, inside of Visual Studio, specifically targeted at building data-based applications. Um, so if the application revolves around data, then Light Switch is a super good fit for the type of app you're probably going to want to build. Um, really what Light Switch does is it handles all the plumbing for you related to working with data, searching and finding data, inserting data, updating data, deleting data. All of that stuff you don't have to write code for. Light Switch will handle it for you. So really all the code you're writing in a Light Switch application is the code, only the code that you the code that only you could write, which is your business logic and, and um, algorithms around how your um, application should work. LightSwitch um, also provides this roadmap. So, for instance, when you create a LightSwitch application, you don't have to decide what type of deployment you want to have up front. You can decide that later. So as your user base grows, as your scalability needs grow, you can deploy light switch in different ways. So there's a flexible deployment model. There's also a very easy publish to the Azure cloud. So you can start with a desktop single user application and go all the way to a full-blown Azure app without having to change any of your code. Okay, so that's kind of what light switch is in a nutshell. Um, you can go to msdn.com slash light switch to learn all about what it is and, um, and, and that kind of stuff if you, if you haven't had time to play with it before. But this talk is going to focus a little bit more on what we've done since we've released light switch. The first release of light switch was at the end of June last year. Um, and now we're basically in the Dev 11 train. Last year when we launched, we launched a contest, actually at the beginning of the year, we launched a contest. And we have a lot of applications that were submitted, the real-world applications that were submitted, some amazing things that people built with LightSwitch. So if you're interested in learning, like, what can you do with LightSwitch, please go to bit.ly, LightSwitch Star, and you'll see the LightSwitch Star contest, a ton of submissions um, in there. We also had a few um, Azure submissions as well. So take a look at that for some examples. Okay, so I'm going to go over what the development experience is like with LightSwitch. Um, then we're going to talk about its architecture, then we'll talk about what's new, and then I'm going to move into demos and I'll, I'll build an application from scratch. So you can kind of see the end-to-end -end experience as well as I'll point out the new features as we go. So like I mentioned, Light Switch is all about data. So the first thing you're asked to do is describe your data. You can either create data through the light switch development environment itself, or you can point to a variety of different types of data sources if you already have existing data. The second thing you do then is you're going to create screens. So light switch is really all about data and screens. So you're going to create screens for common tasks, and we provide a set of uh, predefined templates for you to use as starting points for your screens. The next step, actually, and at the point of start, you pretty much have a full blown up. We can have a fairly fully functional application, um, basically anything that needs to insert, update, delete, or search for data, you don't need to write any code for. However, you're probably going to want to refine the application because there's going to be additional um, uh, functionality you're going to need to provide, like the business logic. Okay, so you're going to need to provide validation on properties, um, screen workflows, um, anything related to the business um, value. 
And then you're probably going to need, want to customize the screen layouts because you might find that the templates aren't really enough for your needs. As your data grows, obviously you're going to need to define some queries to filter data so that users aren't overloaded with too much information. So at this point, you, you can have a, a done deal application. Um, LightSwitch is providing business value in this area here. But if you, like we all know, uh, you get scope creep and business requirements change and grow over time. And the little, the little, the little productivity application that you've written for your department uh, decides to be a mission critical application, and now you're going to need to add to the add to the experience because the users are so demanding, aren't they? So LightSwitch provides a a fairly rich extensibility model so that you can go ahead and create custom, not just custom controls, but you can create custom um, um, functionality. You can build any type of any, any code you could write in the .NET uh, world, you can actually um, plug into LightSwitch in a lot of different ways. Some of the, if you explore some of the um, extensions that the community and our control and component vendors have created, there's a lot of amazing things that you can plug into LightSwitch. So you can also create your own custom controls yourself without having to create a full-blown extension. Um, you could just say, you know, create a uh, star rating control or, or something that's not in the box. Uh, you can also integrate with custom data sources by building your own um, custom RIA services or entity framework for providers. And there actually are um, uh, folks like RSS Bus that are uh, providing a lot of different uh, data connectors to, say, for instance, QuickBooks and Salesforce and all other all kinds of external data sources. Okay, so really, LightSwitch um, provide provides this um, sort of I guess a, it's a it's an environment where you know you are are writing an application and all your um, all the plumbing is taken care of for you, so you're just focusing on that. But it also provides a, an extensibility model, so you don't hit a glass ceiling. So what whatever is um, in the box, it may get you through um, a, a normal application, maybe just fine for that. But sometimes you need to extend it, and we wanted to make sure that light switch wasn't going to um, hold you back. Okay, so I'm not going to get into the extensibility model, but um, there's a lot of information on the developer center around building your own extensions, and uh, and maybe we'll take a look at some of the of the extensions available when I do the demo. Okay, let's talk about the architecture. What the heck is a light switch application in the end? So. Even though you don't really may not know what you're building under the hood, this is what you're getting. You're getting an end tier application. So logically, uh, LightSwitch is building uh, tiers for you. There's a client tier, middle tier, and then your data access layer. Physically, when you deploy an application, you can deploy it in a variety of configurations. But logically, the architecture is always an end tier architecture. On the client tier, we have this concept of what's called a data workspace. So you have screens and you have methods and controls on these screens, and the data workspace is handling, um, managing all the data within that screen for you. So you don't have to worry about marshalling your own data back and forth in the middle tier. LightSwitch is going to handle that all for you. So in essence, a user is working with one screen. They're working with the data workspace around that screen. Um, WCF data services are used be to communicate between the client tier and the middle tier. That's your OData services, and that's actually a, a big new feature uh, with LightSwitch and Visual Studio 11. The previous version of Visual, uh, Visual Studio LightSwitch used RIA services, um, and so we've opened up the middle tier to use OData services for better interoperability with other business systems. So on your client, you, are, you have a Silverlight UI, and you can host that inside the browser or outside the browser, depending on how you want your, uh, depending on the, um, the requirements of your application. So you would use a desktop host if you had a requirement where you needed to do a lot of comm automation or needed to access uh, the file system, and you were on a Windows machine or a Windows network. Um, if you wanted to have more reach and you wanted to you know, reach out to Mac computers, not just Windows and different browsers, you would use a browser-based application 
um, and, and you could use the browser host. Okay, so it's just, just a Silverlight 5 application um, on the client tier. In the middle tier, you have um, the submit and query pipelines, very powerful pipelines for doing complex business uh, rules and workflows. The data workspace, as I mentioned, is um, marshaled back and forth between the client and middle tier. So a lot of the uh, validation rules and that sort of thing that you're performing, you're writing in one place, but they're running on both tiers, okay, as you would expect. Uh, you write business rules in one place, and Lightswitch knows where to run them. When you write a business rule around a query or an update, it's always going to run in the middle tier. When you write a uh, validation rule on a property, it runs on both tiers. So it's your application, when you deploy it as a... Um, a three-tier app, it's going to be running in ASP.NET on IIS. Um, if you deploy it as a two-tier application, you're going to need to have the full .NET framework on your uh, desktop because you're deploying the whole middle tier and client tier smashed together. But typically, you're going to be deploying the middle tier on its own web server. It's just a web application that's running in ASP.NET. Uh, we support IIS 6 and 7 plus as well. And then your data access. Your data access is to the different data sources that we support in the box, which would be any flavor of SQL Server back to 2005, SQL Azure, SharePoint, um, and any other OData or RIA services. Um, other means if you have an Entity Framework 4 provider installed to that can communicate with the Oracle or DB2 or whatever it is, you can also use those um, Entity Framework providers, and LightSwitch will connect to those types of databases as well. So it, it provides a lot of flexibility. And as I mentioned, there are component vendors that have other um, data sources that you could use, like uh, QuickBooks and, and, and uh, Salesforce and Dynamics and all sorts of stuff. So as you can imagine, um, if you have any data source that can either work with an any framework provider or provide as an OData service uh, or even SharePoint that provides OData services. You can create these um, data. You can basically aggregate all the data into one application in LightSwitch, and, Light and then you can virtually relate them together even. So you can actually aggregate and pull from many data sources to create these pretty cool data mashups. Okay, so this is like the the – high-level architecture of LightSwitch. Um, it's doing, it's using end-tier best practices here for you, although you really don't have to know that when you're building the app itself. Okay, let's talk about some of our design goals for Dev11. Um, the first version of LightSwitch, as I mentioned, was uh, released in, in July, so it's been a quick turnaround for us as a team to um, build some compelling features into the second version with such a short cycle on our plate. Um, so the biggie was that we really wanted to open up the middle tier for better interoperability with other business systems. Right In the first version of LightSwitch, we were using RIA services, and the middle tier was pretty much a black box. It, it didn't really have a very open endpoint into the middle tier itself. So if you wanted to create another client or access the middle tier business rules from another system, it was pretty clunky and it was pretty hard to do. Um, so what we did instead was we pretty much ripped out the whole guts of the plumbing of our middle tier and replaced the RIA services pipeline with an OData services. And so now we have these OData endpoints. Um, and if you guys um, go to, let's see, it's www.odata.org, you can read about um, what OData is. It's basically a, a better way um, and a standard way to communicate with database systems over the web. Um, we also wanted to make it easier to work with legacy databases. Uh, we found that a lot of folks that were using external data sources were pulling in databases that were um, maybe didn't define relationships within the database or were very old and, and really needed to do some more data modeling on the model side but they were not able to change the back end because there were many other systems that relied on these legacy databases, so you didn't want to touch them. So we tried to make it easier to work with legacy databases by allowing you to define these um, virtual relationships within those containers. We also wanted to modify or modernize, really modify too. We wanted to modernize the client look and feel. So we provided, we're going to, I'm going to show you a new shell that is going to be included in the box when we release and be the default shell for the client application. Um, also, you know, it, it always is the hardest thing about um, 
developing software, at least I, in my ex, in my experience, is uh, not building it; it's deploying it. Once you build this great system, it works on my box, but it won't work anywhere else. <laughs> so we really wanted to. There was a lot of deployment pain. There always is a lot of deployment pain when it comes to web apps and different configurations and different you know versions of IIS and SQL Server and network setup and all that. So we wanted to make it a lot easier and a lot more predictable. And so we, instead of creating our own deployment uh, wizard type of thing, we're actually going to be piggybacking on a lot of the same exact um, deployment steps that you perform for any other web project in Visual Studio as well. Um, so, and of course, we had, we tried to address customer feedback. As I mentioned, it was a very short cycle between our RTM and our beta of, of Dev 11. So we did address some customer feedback that we uh, that we ha got through um, Connect, and our user voice site came in kind of late, but we did actually ma uh, manage to grab um, some of the main features uh, like. A logo on a login screen and that sort of thing. So if you take a look at our user voice site, we've started to go through and uh, mark things as in review or completed. Um, so hopefully people are a little bit happier with some of the stuff that we did. Okay, so let's get into the nitty-gritty details. I mentioned these OData services. So here are, here's the fallout of all of those of those goals. Um, really, WCF data services, it's now, it does provide these OData endpoints. So as you bring in, as you create your data through LightSwitch or as you bring in external data services or sources, those become service endpoints, addressable endpoints to any, any other client. Um, that can consume OData. So opening up this middle tier not only enables other clients, but it enables other uh, business systems to easily communicate with it. Um, OData is really becoming, it actually is, I don't know if it's, it's still expanding. Um, there's a lot of, of, of non-Microsoft vendors using OData because it's such a standard protocol um, and an easy to, really easy to use protocol for doing CRUD over the web, um, create, uh, retrieve, update, delete of data. Okay, so not only can, not only does, and you get that for free. LightSwitch just automatically creates these services. You don't have to turn a button or do anything. If you're upgrading your uh, version one projects to to uh, to version two here, they automatically are exposed as O data uh, endpoints. Um, not only can we expose them, but we also can consume OData services. So you'll see that as a new data source type where that you can select. Um, this allows you to pull in external data services to augment and enhance your application. Um, for instance, we can go to the Azure data market and you can, there's a lot of free data there. There's a lot of pay per transaction data there. Um, and you can pull a lot of those data services into your apps for um, um, just to uh, kind of enhance them. Also, if you're you're using SQL Server reporting services um, in your in your enterprise, uh, those reports are can actually be um, can actually be uh, uh, I guess served served out served up as uh, OData as well. So you can do a lot of um, interesting things with OData. As I mentioned, we have these conceptual foreign keys now inside of database data sources. So these virtual relationships are allowed inside the same container um, to allow for uh, very old legacy databases or databases that don't define relationships within. Um, those of you that have used LightSwitch, you know the better you can describe your data and relationships between the data, the better LightSwitch can do for you when it comes to generating the UI. So it's important to, to fully describe the relationships between your entities so that your screens end up making a lot more sense and, you, and a lot less code and queries to write at that point. Uh, one of my favorite features that we've added is uh, the row level entity set filtering. This, this comes into play a lot of times when you're trying to do row level security, for instance. You have a bunch of data in your database. You only want certain users to see certain sets of data. So this uh, row level uh, set filtering is uh, available for your database data sources. And it allows you to, you don't have to use it around security, but say you have discontinued products and you never want, you know, to surface that in any of the clients, um, you can enter um, a filter on the entity sets. Not only is that, um, is that behavior, uh, it, is it used on the client for the Silverlight client? So the Silverlight client obviously pays attention to it, but any o, other OData client will pay attention to it because this stuff has happening in the middle tier. So any business rules you write, including the, the row level, any set filtering, is going to happen in the middle tier. 
Okay, so we've also got some new business types, uh, web address and percentage. Um, so those I, those were customer requests. Um, I think we even have a couple of folks out in the community that have written web addresses and percentages, so now they're actually just in the box. So those are some new business types. Um, we also... Obviously, with um, Visual Studio 11, they've moved to the new version of SQL Server. Instead of SQL Server Express, they're using SQL Server Local DB. Local DB is a much lighter weight development database. Um, when you develop an application in the development environment in, in LightSwitch, it's going to be using Local DB instead of SQL Express now. So it's a lot, lot less, um, lot less memory being used up uh, because the service will shut. The service is shut down, so they're not always running like they are with SQL Server. Obviously, when you deploy, you can de still deploy to any flavor of SQL Server. Security. So here's here's one where we, we had, uh, this was a customer request as well, and it actually made a ton of sense. When you um, specify security or you, how you want uh, authentication to work in LightSwitch, you can choose Forms Off or you can choose Windows Off. Now, when you have Windows authentication, we were allowing any any Windows authenticated user to to access the system, or you could choose to specifically put user logins in the system um, for access. Well, what ends up happening in large enterprises, that is, could be thousands and thousands of users that you have to add into the system. Instead, people wanted to just be able to support an Active Directory security group. So now you can just enter the AD security group in there, and, and, and uh, LightSwitch will, will uh, pay attention to that. Okay, so it's a lot easier. Some of the UI design improvements, I mentioned the new shell. Um, you'll see that. It's actually pretty cool. It just kind of modernizes the UI a bit and gets rid of kind of like a lot of the white space that was used in the other default shell. This will be, be becoming the default shell for new projects. Um, I'm going to be running beta. In beta, it's it's an extension. Uh, we want to still get your feedback on some of the some of the uh, the UI metaphors in there and, and the fe feedback on the shell, how it's working. But once we release, it will be actually in the box, and it will be the default for new projects. We also wanted to make it easier to add static images and text. Uh, before, you would have to add a property on your screen, and then you would have to set that in code. Instead, you can just, just put a static image or text anywhere in the content tree. We also um, have a group box, and we have some um, formatting options that you actually specify on the data designer, uh, but you can format uh, dates and numerical values any way you'd like now. Um, I mentioned that logo on the login screen. That was uh, one of, like, I think, the number one or two. No, Actually, number three requested uh, um, feature in LightSwitch, and, and that makes a lot of sense. You want to see a logo when you log into the screen so the user knows what the heck they're logging into. It just makes perfect sense. Um, this this is not in beta yet, but it will be in, in, the, in the next uh, refresh okay, that you get, and it definitely will be at, our, at the final release. Um, we've got some deployment enhancements, as I mentioned. Really, a sim it really revolves around simpler and, and more predictable publishing experience to Azure as well as, as Internet Information Services. So Azure right now, uh, you in the beta, you won't see a ton of new new stuff there, but we've got we're working on a lot of um, enhancements to make that a better experience. Um, you will see, though, uh, a lot of nice things that we've added for our, our IIS publishing, like better, gener nicer generation of the packages and with, you know, the um, with the commands to install the package on IIS 6 and 7. We just make it a lot easier. We also make it so that you can also, um, like, test the publishing before you actually do the publishing to see if you're going to catch any errors before you actually do it. Okay, I have a I have a bunch of articles on my blog kind of explaining that, and we'll we'll be releasing even more features um, in our final release. So just to look for a lot of good stuff around around uh, deployment because we know that that's a lot of pain is in deployment. Okay, let's talk about OData and what the architecture of the OData service pipeline looks like. Since this is the, really the largest feature that, that we've um, added to LightSwitch in this version, it's important to how, how to understand how it works. So really, when, it, when you create data with, through the LightSwitch development environment, you're creating what's called this intrinsic data source. That's, by default, named application data. That becomes an endpoint, OK? So your LightSwitch client is going to connect to it, and any other OData client could also connect to it. And that will be you know, any, any uh, um, entities that you've modeled within LightSwitch. Then any other external data sources that you bring into LightSwitch, uh, OData services, other feeds, um, SharePoint, or other databases, also become endpoints as well. 
Now, what's really cool is the business rules and user permissions, they will run no matter what client is talking to these services. So those are all housed in, in the middle tier. So that's where you're going to be writing your filtering. What You're going to be writing all of your property you know, validations. Uh, they also run on the middle tier. So really, um, you can think of LightSwitch as being able to, to quickly create not only uh, database applications, but data services as well. OK, so that's conceptually how, how it works. When you look at your project system, um, your solution explorer, each data source is listed separately here. There's the application data, and I have this example, um, crime data. This is how you access the OData services. So if you guys aren't familiar with OData, you, there's a set of URI conventions that really are used um, on, via HTTP REST for doing CRUD operations. So for instance, if I wanted to access all the appointments in my system in this example, I would go to slash application data SVC slash appointments, and all my appointments would come through in an, in an RSS feed. Um, it also, an OData service can also return um, the data as a JSON as well. So there are a ton of clients, uh, libraries out there, and a ton of server libraries that are, are not necessarily for .NET. So in .NET, we're using WCF data services to create OData services. There are other libraries for a, a bunch of other platforms um, that, you know, that you can use if you're not on uh, Microsoft technology. Okay, so it really is more of a, an ubiquitous way to access data. Okay, so let's, t let's talk about my demos here. I'm, I, I kind of like going through a slides and then jumping into demos, and I've got, you know, about 45 minutes or so of, of good demos, and then we'll get to questions. So I'm going to... Um, consume an OData. I'm going to build an app from scratch so that so those of you who have never seen LightSwitch before, you can kind of get what the development experience is like. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to build in some new all these new features. So I'm going to consume a Netflix uh, data service, which is just a public data service sitting out there that we can grab. Um, I'm going to create an application that just tracks our favorite movies and CDs and some things like that. Um, then I'll show you how how LightSwitch has automatically created these data services. We'll walk through some of the new business types, and I'll show you some of the new UI design improvements, and then we're going to add um, some row-level filtering around some security. And if we have some time, um, I will show you some alternative OData clients, um, particularly um, PowerPivot in Excel, because LightSwitch is all about business applications, and this is a, uh, PowerPivot in Excel is a really great way to do um, some BI data analysis, for, um, especially over OData services. Okay, so let me get to our demo. All right, so file new project. This is Visual Studio 11 beta. So I'm, let's create a new project. Okay, so I'm going to create a light switch app here. Let's call it Media Mate. Okay, so the first thing you always do with light switch is start with data. It's right center smack dab in our faces, so we can either start by creating a new table or we can attach to an external data source. I'm going to actually go to an external data source first, and here's where you're going to see um, our OData service. This is kind of a new entry here into the uh, data source wizard in Visual Studio 11. So I'm going to attach to that Netflix service. Let's see what we got here. It's uh, OData.Netflix. Dot com uh, version two slash catalog. How did I know that? If you go to www.odata.org, there's a whole list of all these public services that you can take and play with. Okay, we don't need any login information. If there was, you would need to provide some of that. It just depends on what service you're connecting to. Okay, so let's take a look at the entities that we have. So basically what I'm going to do is I want to use the Netflix catalog to select titles um, on my people and my, their favorites. So let me just keep track of, of people's favorite movies and stuff. So I'm going to just bring in titles here in this case. And what's going to do is it's going to need to pull in additional tables because there's there's ref, there's a referential integrity between some of these relationships defined between some of these things. Um, also, there's um, the the types that Light Switch cannot um, ca cannot support, like complex types, uh, will not also not be in there. So I'm just going to uh, let Light Switch pull in what it needs, and so now you'll see that we've got 
some extra tables with some relationships here. But title is really the main table I want to work with. Okay, so this is just the standard data designer. Um, what I'm going to do is, because in data, uh, what normally when you create a any tables through LightSwitch and um, you run the UI, every data grid has a search functionality on the top, top of it. So by default, um, all of the string properties are searchable here. Now, when we bring in an external data source, like an OData service, this could potentially cause, uh, you know, some performance issues, depending on how far away that, that service is. So just for, you know, actually for, for performance reasons, we're going to uncheck some of these things. And when we uh, final, when the final release, when you pull in a data service, or it's going to have a lot of these unchecked. I think it's just going to have the summary property checked for you. Okay, so we're going to uncheck some of these. I'll just leave name, and actually I'm going to just leave name as searchable, but the rest of these I'm going to uncheck. Otherwise, it would just take a longer, much longer time for us to search the OData service. Okay, I won't have to do this uh, later. Okay, short synopsis, URL. Um, actually, and for what, for what I'm going to do here, I'm going to modify some of these um, types. Um, these are the business types that are compatible with the string. You'll notice that we have a web address, so I'm going to change the URL to a web address here. Um, I'm actually going to uncheck this, and uh, let's see, that's a web address. State time is okay. Yeah, type, we don't need to search on type. And here's another URL, so that's the website, so let's change that. Uh, we don't need to check that. And uh, tiny URL is also a web address. Okay, so that's cool. All right, so that's good enough. Um, the other thing I'm going to do is, since all the IDs here are our strings, um, that was, I don't need to search on the ID for this, and this is summary property should actually probably be the name, okay, of the title. All right, so that's kind of like how we've modeled our, our data coming from that OData service. Now let's go ahead and add a new table to start tracking uh, our favorites. Okay, so the first thing uh, I'm going to do is person. We have some people. And I'm just going to have a name, and uh, we'll do their email. Okay, make that an email address. And we're going to have a picture for them, make that an image. Okay, and I'm also going to track, is there celebrity? Okay, make that a Boolean. Okay, so there's our person, and then we're going to need to um, add another table for tracking the favorites. So let's go favorite. Okay, and... I'm going to need to add a relationship um, from the person to the favorite. Okay, so this is just a one-to-many relationship, so let's do that. We're also going to need to add a, re a virtual relationship to those titles. Okay, so you'll notice that because it's an external data source, we have this dotted line. I'll need to store the title ID over on our favorite. So LightSwitch will keep track of um, the relationship for us and filtering and all that stuff, and we'll hook all the data up correctly on our screens. Um, it just can't enforce the um, referential integrity here. Okay, that's, that's all that means. Okay, so, um, and I'm just going to uncheck the title ID. I don't want to display it. All right, so for favorite, um, I, w I need a summary property that kind of makes sense, so when people see the favorites, they're not looking at ID numbers. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a computed property, and that's just called, you know, display display name, okay? And so what we're going to do is this first time we're going to write a little bit of code uh, just to check to make sure that if we, if we, uh, if not, let's see, the uh, title, let's we'll do that, is nothing. Oops, I have a bad keyboard today, sorry. Uh, too much coffee actually makes me shake. Okay, so making sure that the title isn't nothing, then we'll just make sure that we do results equals me dot title dot name. So we'll just display the title name for each favorite. Okay. All right, cool. Let's, uh, that's kind of what we're getting done with our data model. Let's start adding some screens so we can try to start taking a look at what we're, what our UI is going to look like. So let's add a new screen. The first screen I'm going to do when we, when users come into the application, uh, I want to do a search screen on the people. Okay, so we're going to need that first. Um, I'm also going to need to add people into the system. I don't have any, so I'm going to, I don't have any data at all. So we're going to do a new data screen on person. Notice it will pick up the, um, the uh, any of child relationships here. I'm not going to add it onto the new screen, but what we'll do is we'll create one other screen is the detail screen for the people, and we're going to go ahead and check off the favorites. So anytime we, uh, we access a person, this is the screen that will be used.
Okay, here are your screen templates, by the way. Um, those new to light switch, these, this is an extensibility point too, so you could load more if you needed, but these are the five different types of screens that you can use. These are just starting points. You can obviously change them around how you like. Okay, so um, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, go, we're going to run this. Okay, we'll take a look at this first, see, see what it looks like. We might need to change some things around. Let's go ahead and run this, but first what I want to do is I want to enable the new shell. Okay, so like I mentioned, this that new shell, the cosmopolitan shell, will be a standard. Right now, it's it's still set to in beta. It's still set to the office look. So let's go in into our extensions um, in Light Switch. You can load this really easily going to the extension manager. If you go to online extensions and you just do Light Switch. Okay, we'll take a look at all of the light switch extensions that are available. There's a lot of them. Um, so you can you can grab the Cosmopolitan shell. Like if, if I type Cosmo, you can grab the Cosmopolitan shell right from the extension manager. I already have it installed. Okay, so that's how I got it. So let's go ahead and enable it. And then let's see what it looks like because I'm going to change the theme and the shell. Um, in this particular shell, you get a logo. So let's go ahead and uh, take a look. And get a logo here. Let's see. What have we got? I got some logos somewhere. Here we go. All right. So cool logo. I made that. All right. Um, and obviously an icon is still, if you want to support an icon, you can do that as well. So that's good enough. Let's go ahead and uh, hit a 5 debug and run this thing, see what it looks like. Okay, so we have no data, so let's go ahead. Now, you'll notice that here's the new shell. We don't have, uh, we're not taking up the left-hand side for the navigation menu anymore. Navigation menu is right at the top. The logo is always displayed at the top, so you get some nice corporate branding if you need it. Um, so your tasks, it's going to be more of a traditional menu style up here, a little bit more web. Um, you'll also see that the, the um, icons are very flat, like the metro style. Okay, so let's go ahead and add a new person. Um, we'll add myself. And notice, uh, let's see, if we not don't type in an email, you'll see that here's the here's the adornment here. It's kind of like off to the side. It's nice. It's kind of nice. It's a little bit nicer. Um, I'll say B Massey. Oh, actually, it's Beth M A. That's I don't want you to get my personal address. <laughs> my dad just sends jokes to it, anyways. All right, let's get a picture. That looks good because it's been a while. Um, and then celebrity, uh, we can check off whether or not I'm a celebrity. I don't really think I'm a celebrity, so uh, I'm just going to uncheck that. All right, so once we click save, now we've got the person details. Uh, we can go ahead and add our favorites in. Now, one of the things that I noticed, that I've, I'm going to be pulling a lot of Netflix data. Okay, so using a traditional um, autocomplete box isn't going to really cut it for this um, for this guy. So I'm going to go in and design the screen a little bit differently so that instead of using this autocomplete box that we've got this drop down here, I'm going to change that to the modal window picker. A modal window picker will allow us to do a search over the data as well. It's a lot nicer. Um, obviously, the favorite and the, the, the display name, this, this is not really needed. All I really need to do is show the title itself. Um, also, I don't want to just display the title name. I want to display a little bit more information in here. So I'm going to change it from a summary to picture and text. Um, and I'm not going to really use the picture. I'm just going to use the, the name. Um, subtitle, I want to be the, um, the release year, for instance, and the description, the short synopsis. And I'll just make it a little bit nicer. Um, also, I want to make this title show as link within the modal window picker. And what Light Switch will do is it'll auto generate a screen for us just so that I can take a little bit more details um, before I make a selection uh, of what, you know, what the title is. Make sure I got it right. Okay, so um, also what I'm going to do is instead of a columns layout, I'm going to change this to here's the new group box control. It's a little, little bit better grouping um, in there. Okay, so let's go ahead and save that. Okay, so see, because here's a group box instead, so it just draws this nice border around it. Okay, so now that I've got that modal window picker instead, let's go ahead and, and see what we can pull up. So this is going to be the, the Netflix query. So there we go. We've got um, basically it's not in order, okay? It's just pulling down the uh, the 
first four, eight, every 45. There's, like, there's a lot of there's a lot of titles, obviously, and Light Switch will not pull them all down at once. Um, by default, it just pulls down 45 rows at a time, although it's in no kind of particular order. Okay, so really, what I want to do is I want to create a query um, and sort these things and make it a little bit easier for me to pick through them. Okay, so let's go ahead and go ahead and stop this. Actually. I will save myself here. Actually, no, I won't save. I don't need to save. All right. Oh, yes. I said okay. Yes. There we go. Um, let's go ahead and add a query for our titles. Okay. So add a query. And in this case, it'll just be sorted titles. Okay. And we'll just do a sort by the name. That'll make a little bit more sense to our users. And now I'm going to just go back to the person detail where I was and use that query on the screen. So let's add a data item. Here's the query. There's the sorted titles. Okay. And now I just need to hook that up to the choice list here, sorted titles. All right. So it'll be a little bit better. Um, and that's cool. And what I also wanted to do is make this a link as well. Let's show that. There we go. All right, so let's see if that looks a little bit better now. Okay, so let's go in here. Now we've got the modal window picker, and what's now it's happening is Light Switch is executing a a a sort. Okay, sort by to to the the Netflix service, so here's where it comes back with, and now things are, are sorted A to Z. So now I can go down and I can, you know, I, I've got some uh, sort, I can even sort by other things if you want, okay? So what what happened was Light Switch goes ahead and, and um, does all of the querying for you over the wire to the data service, and so there's a whole URI um, uh, uh, convention. There's a whole query language around OData, and Light Switch is doing that for us. Okay, so I'm just going to click into something and it opens up the screen and it pulls down the rest of the data for me here and if we go ahead and we can take a, a look at is this like something I want to to choose as a favorite I don't know country queens I'm not really a country fan honestly but um, looks like I, I lost my search box on there but I can go ahead and select one of them let's see we also need to make this a little bit bigger so let's go ahead and design the screen you can fool around with some of this. So, for instance, this is just not very big. So let's go ahead and make this a little bit bigger. Um, let's see. The I always forget which. Let's do pix, pixels width. I don't know. 400 pixels. Probably a little bit bigger. There we go. Maybe 400 is a little bit too big. Okay. 200. All right. Um, and you can mess around with it. I think we've got... I think it looks pretty good, honestly. You can fool around with a little bit more what's going on. Um, you can add, let's for instance, add, you can add a new static image and label. Here's a new label here. We can add a new one. Uh, you say hello, you know, on the screen. Okay, so that's some of the new features as well. Okay, there's hello. Okay. Let's actually add a business rule. Um, actually, let me pick a title. I didn't, I didn't add. Okay, we'll do the Women Art Revolution. How's that? Okay, save. Okay, so now that I've got a title here, um, let's let's do something. Let's add another person to our to our system here. We create a new person, and I'm going to add Scott Guthrie here. Scott Gu. I think Scott Gu. I'm sure he's been in many demos before and doesn't mind. There's a good picture of him. Um, he is a celebrity, though. You know, this guy, this guy's everywhere, right? So let's go ahead and make him a celebrity um, and add another title. One thing I, I'm, one thing is demo gods are not behaving right now. My search box isn't here, so I think what I've done, let me close this down real quick. I've got Scott here in the system, but I want to make sure this is working, so I don't know why this isn't working. Sorted titles. Uh, support search. I think I must have unchecked that as I was fooling around with the property sheet sheet. So I want to be able to support the searching here so that I can search for a better title for Scott Guthrie because I'm pretty sure that guy doesn't like country. I could be wrong. Um, 
Okay, let's add let's add Scott. I'm not really sure what movies he likes, um, but I'm thinking something. Yeah, there's the search again. So I'm thinking something more like I don't know Star Wars or something. There we go. That's better. Oops. Well, that's okay. That's fun. Okay, try one more time. It's always a beta product. Okay, ignore and continue. Okay. All right. Well, I guess it doesn't like the search. I'm not sure why, but that's strange. It worked last night at the user group, I swear. All right. Sweet. Nice. That just disappeared. Let's do support search, support paging, auto execute query. We're all pretty good. Supporting search. All right. Number of items, 15. Uh, yeah, number of items 45, which should be good. All right, one more time, and then I'm going to move on. Okay, let's just get him a title. All right, we'll 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 go with this. All right. Okay, so I've got two people in the system now. Um, one's a celebrity, Scott, and I'm not. What I want to do is I want to add a business rule, and I want to add some row-level security to show off some of the row filtering. So what we're going to do is we're going to play with this new feature um, for the filter feature that I mentioned. So I'm going to go over to people, and we're going to write some code. We write the co When we drop down the write code button, you'll see this uh, new filter method over here on the query. So what I want to do is basically I want to filter out any celebrities if I'm not a system administrator. Okay, so only system administrators can see celebrities in this case. So um, if I'm not me dot application dot um, um, user dot has permission permissions permissions dot system administration if I'm not a system administrator then I'm going to need to provide a filter oops filter that it's a function of people p dot is celebrity equals false okay so now this is going to run anytime we access our middle tier so let's go ahead and let's go ahead and enable this during debug mode when we're going to go over to access control we're actually going to turn on uh, authentication windows authentication I'll allow any windows authenticated user in order to test this uh, we would grant debug to be a system administrator and not grant for debug if we want to test that we're not a system administrator. So let's leave it unchecked and make sure that we're filtering out Scott Guthrie. Now you should only see me in the list. Okay, so there's the filter. Now I mentioned that the business rules are always running no matter what client is connecting to it, regardless of whether it's the light switch client itself or any other service. So let's see how we can play with those O data services that are created. Now, remember, we've got the application data SVC and the Netflix data catalog. And the easy way while we're debugging to take a look at the services is to just flip the client over to a web client so that it opens up in the browser instead. Okay, so now we can see the port number here while we're in development mode, and we can take a look at this. We'll go over here, and now we can say application data dot SVC, and there is our O data service. Those are our O data service running, and those are the entities that are being surfaced through the feed. So I could say, let me see all the people, and before I hit enter, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over here and I'm going to stick a breakpoint right in here. Okay. So notice I'm just using uh, Internet Explorer now as the client. Now when I hit people, our business rules are going to run, um, and you'll notice that I am not a system administrator. Uh, I don't want to be enough. I'm not a system administrator, so it's going to go ahead and filter out these uh, those records. And so you'll see that it only returned me, Beth Massey. That's the end of the feed right here. Okay. So Scott Guthrie is hidden um, from any OData client because I'm not a system admin. Okay, so that's pretty cool. That's a pretty powerful feature. Um, as I mentioned, the OData services, just as an aside, uh, you can 
we can view them. Actually, pretty pretty nice uh, way to look at stuff on the wires using Fiddler. Um, you can actually return not only let's hit it one more time. You can not only um, RSS, but you can return JSON as well. So if we took a, take a look at what that returned, here's the well. Let's look at it in um, XML. So here's the XML that it returned, right? So if we want to return JSON, let's see what uh, here's the Header. Let me take a look at the raw header here. Okay, so there's the query that we executed. Okay, no problem. I'm going to go over here, and we're going to go to the composer. I'm going to, I want to hit that again, but in this case, I want to make the request header uh, return JSON instead. So the only w the we, what we need to do is we just need to say. Now you would set this in your your request header when you, in your code when you want to return JSON. Application uh, JSON. Okay, so um, go ahead and execute that. Now we go back over here. Now we can actually see that. Um, whoop, where is it? Did it not work? It should be JSON. And oh, it's oh, it's paused. <laughs> it hasn't returned yet. Yes, continue, please. There we go. Okay, so now you can see that it's returned as JSON. So I have that breakpoint still set. Okay, so that's just a, that's just an aside on no data, and that's just basically the, trying to reinforce the fact that LightSwitch is just producing a standard set of OData services that support all the uh, normal set of URI conventions. Okay, so awesome. I love OData. I actually am doing a nice big OData talk at TechEd if anybody's going. Um, so I'll get more into OData there. So let's go ahead and kind of take a look really quickly at some of the deployment um, enhancements okay, that we've made. I'm going to close all these, close these down. So when we go ahead and deploy the application, let's go ahead and just walk through the publish wizard really quick. Okay, so same kind of questions are being asked here, whether or not we want this to be a web or a desktop application. Here's some choices here uh, about where we want to deploy it. They're very similar as before. Uh, one of the things we've added is import settings. So similar to if you're familiar with web matrix, you can import settings from an ISP, um, and that way it makes it much more predictable when the deployment happens because the settings are coming directly from um, whatever ISP or ISP administrator has given you. Okay, so um, the light switch deployment prerequisites are still here in the um, in the beta. These prerequisites, we're going to basically be using standard the standard uh, web PI, the web platform installer feeds for any um, um, web application that you deploy. Okay, so there's really not anything light switch specific uh, in in these prerequisites. Really, all these are are just um, a set of settings to make sure that you've set up IIS correctly and you, you've, um, you've set up a database correctly and that sort of thing. Okay, so right now, what little bit more enhancements when we create a package on disk now, we're actually going to be creating the, um, the XML file and the commands that can install the package on the command line, which you need to do in IIS 6 um, because there's no way to do that through the UI. So we just made it a little bit nicer um, that way. Uh, I will go ahead and generate that. Um, we give you the option to generate the SQL script regardless of whether you're um, publishing directly or not. You can, if you're publishing directly, you can choose whether or not to database schema. Okay, so to do that, so you get a little more options there. Um, and uh, you know, basically, I'm going to say yes, create the application administrator or not. Um, and here are your data connections. So it's similar as before. When you have external data sources, you need to um, supply these in the web config file. Okay, so those are just some of the uh, some of the really quickly ran through some of the IIS enhancements. I'm going to go ahead and publish the package onto disk. I've actually already deployed this uh, MediaMate uh, application already. So I'm going to take a look. While it's publishing, let's go to Media Media Mate. Okay, so I've done Media Mate done here. Okay, so it's already deployed in this case. Okay, and uh, notice I had actually put my boss in here before in this version of it. Notice Scott Guthrie though is still not showing up. He's actually in the system. I am not a system administrator when I'm hitting this. I'm not logged in as a system admin. Okay, so let's um, let's take a look at. The application data SVC. Okay, same thing. What I'm going to do though is I'm going to open up Excel now. 
Okay, and I've loaded what's called Power Pivot. If you're not familiar with Power Pivot, it's a free add-in to Excel. And what it's going to do is it allows you to connect to all sorts of data sources that aren't aren't supported directly in the box in Excel. And it also takes data and does a major compression algorithm on, on data. So when you pull data sources from multiple places um, and create these, you know, data mashups and do your BI, create your charts and, and design your app within um, Excel, you actually, when you save it, it will save to a very small or a much smaller size, okay? So notice you can pull data from all sorts of other types of databases. Um, from the Azure data market, you'll need to sign up for the data market, and that's where you, you have a set of uh, data sets available. Uh, some are free, some are pay. Um, from data feeds, and that's what I'm going to pull from, I've got the, uh, the application data service. So let's go ahead and um, next. And it's going to pull, here are the, the two entities. I'm going to go ahead and pull in both of them. Okay, so obviously I don't have a lot of data here, but this is a way that you could go ahead and then I've got people and favorites and you can go ahead and do any kind of analysis over your data. I don't have a ton of data. So I've got another application that has more data in here. Uh, Contoso Construction. Okay, this is a sample that is available on the samples gallery, and it's uh, it, I've augmented it to include some um, data from the Azure data market, actually. So if we go into, say, a project, and it just manages, it's just a fictitious construction company, and it manages projects and that sort of thing. Um, so I'm going to show a map of this property, and on this screen, um, I'm using the big map control that was available in version one, but what I've also done is I've pulled up some city crime information. So I've gone onto the Azure data market and there's a bunch of crime info. So um, this is the town I live in and this is the chances that I could be hurt um, in my own city in these years. So this is just pulling some data from that. So take a look at this sample. It's a free, you know, freebie up there. Um, it's good learning. It's good for learning some of the new features in the, in the, in light switch. So at any rate, this has a lot more data in it. So let's go ahead and take a look at this service. Okay. And this one's probably better to go ahead and use. So I got a lot of a lot more entities in here as well. So I'm going to go to back to Excel and let's go ahead and you can pull, you know, from multiple feeds into the same same spreadsheets. I'm going to go ahead and add all of them. Okay, not a, not a ton, but we've got 299 materials here. We've got, you know, 34 appointments and some projects and that sort of thing. So one thing that um, Power Pivot won't do is pull in the relationships for you. So you just have to define what are the, manage the relationships between these data sources. So I'm going to just, you know, pick a couple here. So we've got uh, project materials. I'm just going to um, relate this to my project. Okay, and I'm also going to relate uh, project materials to the materials themselves. Okay, and um, now we can go ahead and create, uh, I'm not the best whiz on when it comes to Excel, but we can go ahead and create a, uh, a pivot table, and now you will see here are all of the data sources that we pulled in. So if I had a relationship between my people and my, you know, my projects, then I could actually pull across uh, OData services in here. Uh, so let's go ahead and just kind of fool around with this. Let's do the um, maybe the project name on the row label, and uh, let's let's do the price. Maybe we should do maybe quantity times price. So there's some of that. Um, and, you know, we could do the uh, material names maybe to show them off. Okay, so um, I've actually already created a spreadsheet that has, has some more analysis, and this actually comes with the sample itself. Uh, so if you take a look at this, I've created, like, busiest salespeople, number of appointments, the project materials costs, okay, here we create charts on the cost. Um, we can also see if our projects are um, under budget or over budget as well. So play around with that. This is a really, um, really good way to arm your um, information workers and with with an easy way to access and secure way to access your data. So OData services, regardless of whether you're using light switch or not, are a really good way to, to allow users into your data stores securely and safely. Um, cool. So I've got a few minutes here. I think 
I think I was supposed to stop at 2 for questions. Maybe I can go for 2.15. Maybe, Marty, can you tell me how much time I have left? I'm not quite sure. Marty's sleeping. That's okay. All right. Well, I've got a lot of questions. I've got some questions in here, so I'm going to go ahead and look at them. How's that? Um, okay. So, Jose, seems that light switch is no longer an application to persons with no ex programming experience, or am I wrong? By the, by the way, the new version of PowerPoint, it, it does show the relationships between tables. Oh, in 2012. Okay, great. I was probably using the previous version. That's good because I'm glad they added that feature. Um, so the so right switch. Okay, so I did. Sh I was doing a lot, a little bit more. If you noticed, actually, the only code I wrote was around the um, the display name and the um, the filtering. So very minimal programming experience. Um, the light switch has always been about writing some code. It's just not about writing all that boilerplate code. So it's really great. Um, it's a really great tool for developers, I say developers, of all skill levels, okay? So regardless of whether you're a professional developer or whether you are a, a business person that can write some code, it still applies. Um, because Just because we've added OData under the hood doesn't mean that people actually have to know or use it, okay? Um, it's just something I'm, pre I'm presenting to you guys so that you know what are the new features inside of LightSwitch in this version. Okay, so I hope I answered your question there. Um, how can I incorporate, say, Bing Maps into the Light Switch app? Okay, great question. Um, if you let's take a look at how I did that, because I showed that in uh, oops, I showed that in the uh, so construction application. So let's go out and open the project. Um, download this sample, and it has instructions on how you sign up for a Bing Maps Bing Maps key. Uh, once you get a key. You go into, for this, ins for this screen, I have a map screen. Once you install the key, once you get a key and you install the extension, let me show you that. You install the extension, you check off the extension, the big map control, okay? And once you get that extension installed, then when you create your screens, all the big map control wants is text, it wants, well, not the home screen, I wanted to go to the map screen. Um, it just wants the address, okay? So your address is a string property on some, you know, on, uh, on, on some entity. In my case, I have the full address is a calculated property where I'm just appending the city state zip. Uh, when you, it, it, normally it would come in as a text box, right? And you would just drop down the, uh, the, this little drop down right here and choose which type of control. You will see the Bing map control lit up here once you install the extension. Uh, the, like I mentioned, though, the only thing that it needs is this big maps key. Okay, that's not the whole key. If you can memorize that key, you can have the key. Okay, so once you get the key, it will go ahead and, and work. Okay, <clears throat> You can sign up for de developer key for free. Okay, cool. Um, are there any hands-on lab tutorials available for self-paced practice? Absolutely. I'm glad you asked because... One of my favorite resources is msdn.com slash light switch. Okay. Go over and head over there and you'll see step by step how to download light switch. This is the trial version of the released version of light switch. If you want to get the beta, just go into our beta resources here. Um, and then you, there's a set of how do I videos and there's a lot of training on our training page. Here's a, if you're very, very new to programming and you're new to light switch, I would suggest starting with the beginning light switch series. It describes what a table is and how to define relationships and that sort of thing. If you already know like the basics of database design and, and, and programming, um, you can move, you can move through the learning page here. Okay, so for instance, Essential topics have a lot of tips and tricks on how to work with data, screens, queries, code, everything else. The other thing, if you're doing self-paced learning, the training kit is, is a good set of hands-on labs in there, not only for an introduction of how to um, use LightSwitch, but also um, for how to build extensions. So it, it's kind of a good set of labs for all um, skill levels. If you're just starting out um, and you, with no programming experience whatsoever, and you want a um, full-blown application, you can. There's a set of starter kits that you can start with. Okay, so I wrote a post on how to get the starter kits. You basically get them through the extension manager. You can also download them from the web, and these are like full-blown applications that you can use to get started. Okay, so I, I if, there's about six different ones: customer service, issue tracking. Um, you can use these in, in commercial-free, whatever you need to. Do in your in your um, in your um, 
businesses. Okay, so it has a whole set of like instructions on how to get started with them. Okay, so great question. Um, I'm a celebrity. I am a celebrity. <laughs> Thank you very much, Pedro. I appreciate that. Um, can the PPDX be made available for download? Absolutely. Um, we will definitely, I will probably be blogging all about this um, very soon, and I'll make sure that I get that PPTX um, up somewhere, probably on my blog. Um, is there a log off option coming? Um, not that I'm aware of in uh, the next version here, but there is a change of password. Okay, I know that there's a change of password. Log off would be close the app re-log in. Um, that's a great suggestion, though. Make sure that it's on. you vote for it on our user voice site so that we can get it into our product backlog. Um, and, you know, I'll just, I'll make sure, I'll actually double check because I know that we added, we have a changed password. I'm, I'm just not sure if we did a log off yet. Um, please, has MySQL fully supported EF provider for light switch? No limitations. Um, I'm not I'm not the expert when it comes to the EF provider for MySQL. I know that there are tutorials out there on how to get it to work. Um, I'm not. I think there was something to do with the transactions that you have to do, um, but uh, I'm not positive. So shoot me an email and I will get you a couple links. I know that there's other folks that are a little bit more qualified to to answer that one. Okay. Will Light Switch support HTML5 as well as Silverlight 5? I cannot comment on the roadmap at this time past what we've got in this version, um, but I will say to stay tuned for more announcements from the team around that. Um, does Beta 11 address the Red X problem? Um, it, I have it on one of my dev machines and can't figure out how to cure them. Thank you, Beth. Okay, so the Red X problem. The Red X problem, I love that problem, right? You know, that's like the one that you just have no frickin' clue what's going on. So really, they wait. Here's a here's the trick. Okay, let's go into I, I, uh, manager. More than off, more than likely, what's happening when you're getting the Red X is you, your connectivity to your database has died somewhere. So the easiest way to troubleshoot this is go into your deployed application, go into the application settings. Okay, and right here is a trace enabled. Set that to true. Okay, set that to true. Then once you do that, okay, you can go into, let's see, I was back in media, mate. You can go into here, execute the app. Okay, this will actually work. It won't, hopefully it won't show a red X. Um, this will work. But say you get a red X. Go to the trace.axd, and it's going to show you the trace, all the trace information of, like, what you executed at what exact second. And you'll be able, when you click in view details, you're going to see this gigantic red error message. And that's actually going to be the actual error message. And so usually what's happening is, you know, the, the database isn't found or, or the user isn't, you know, access to the database or, or whatever. Okay, so this will really help you trace. I also think that Fiddler will actually help you trace, too. We actually have a post um, on our Light Switch team blog. Let's see. Light, let's see, logs and light switch. That's my blog. Okay, so by Eric. Eric wrote this uh, long post on how to diagnose problems in a three-tiered up light switch application. Okay, so the dreaded red X is is basically uh, this is how you try and figure it out. Um, obviously, you know we. The, with deployment, with the deployment experience improved, um, we're hoping to get rid of a lot of these issues because of the deployment itself. Initial deployment will be better, but you're always, and once you deploy, things can happen, as you know, so you're going to need to figure out uh, what's happening. You can set up trace, different types of tracing levels, okay? I hope that answered your question. Um, Will Visual Studio Lights with IDBE be extensible like the rest of Visual Studio? We would like to add some very nice add-on features. Um, yes, I believe it depends on specifically on what you want to extend, like you want to write your own designer or that sort of thing. I'm not an expert when it comes to Visual Studio extensibility. Um, so if you have specific questions, um, actually, Expert360, hello, Dave. Um, I want to just give a nice shout out to Expert360. They've been creating some really cool data sources. They have a free one from um, that works with Microsoft Dynamics, and you guys are building a Salesforce one, I believe. So um, thank you, Expert360, for all your community support. Dave, I would suggest shooting me an email, and I can hook you up with the right folks um, that are a little more qualified on the extensibility model. Okay, um, how can you connect the Bing map to the data grid? I hope I answered that question. Um, 
So if you connect, if you, inside of the data grid itself, if you want to put in a data grid, if it's a string property, you can just, you can select the, like I said, this, the control once you get it in there. Um, drag a pin to update the ladder, launch to store in the grid. Okay, so this particular Bing map extension that we have only displays the address. So what you would want, to, what you would have to do is cr augment the the Bing Map control itself to do whatever you wanted. Okay, so um, that's a little bit more, you know, programming. But there's a lot of tutorials on how to work with the Bing Maps. The Bing Map control really was just a a sample control that we had in the training kit in the beginning, and it really is just a view only. But so you could actually add more functionality to the control itself if you wanted to. Okay, so how easy is it to upgrade 2010 Lightspeed products to the new version? Okay, so it should be a no-brainer. Okay, there I have I have posted for in in beta. We're still working through a couple issues, but the surefire way to make sure things work is unload all your extensions first. Because what if you're moving to the beta and your extensions are not supporting Visual Studio 11, you won't be able to migrate the extension, okay? What you're really going to need to do is you're going to need to make sure that you have the extensions available or work with Visual Studio 11. Um, so you'll want to uncheck or remove any extensions that don't have corresponding versions um, and then upgrade. And then you can go ahead and check off the extensions that, you know, are working in Visual Studio 11. Okay, so that's kind of the, that's the one caveat. If you're using extensions and they're not supported, um, you could hit some bumps in the road upgrading. Um, the light switch uh, migration wizard will tell you that the extension is not supported, blah, blah, blah. Um, otherwise, if you're just using plain vanilla, you know, projects, there should be absolutely no problem whatsoever upgrading, okay? All right, if you do find issues, please put them in the forums, um, and we will help um, troubleshoot them. We're still in beta. Okay, does this version or V1 of LightSwitch support MS Access? So MS Access as the data source itself is not supported out of the box, and I don't believe we have any providers um, that support Access. So the migration path for Access is migrate the Access data to SQL Server first, and then point LightSwitch at that, okay? Um, is there a better document on the screen lifecycle, order of events, and on which thread it runs, different threads and details? There is, if, if you go back to the, the learning center over on the developer center, there is a screens, you know, working with screens, and there are some um, more advanced topics around there. Um, but I'm not positive we have a screen lifecycle order of events. We have some tips and tricks and that sort of thing, but I will put that on the list of content that we should probably get out there, okay? Thank you for the suggestion. What is the blog URL? The blog URL is uh, is blogs. Sorry, blogs msdn.com slash light switch. Okay, so that's our team blog. Okay, that was an easy question. I like those. Um, change password all existing v1 would be a recover password. Okay, recover password. Uh, no, I don't believe there is a recover password. Uh, it's similar to like Recovering a password would mean that we actually knew what the password was. The passwords are usually um, stored with salt values and that sort of thing, so reverse engineering a password, usually just change the password and you could change it to the same thing it was and you would, might not know that. Okay. Um, if you're using, obviously if you're using Windows authentication, you don't store passwords in the database, so this would be, this would be only for uh, forms authentication. Okay, well, LightSwitch 11 target Windows Phone Metro style. We are not targeting phone applications at this time. Thank you for the suggestion, though. Put, make sure it's on user voice. How do you create reports in LightSwitch? So reports are not, I think you might mean client-side reporting. There's two types of reporting. There's server-side reporting and there's client-side reporting, where you actually are designing a, a report inside of LightSwitch around the entities um, that are displayed on screens inside of LightSwitch. Um, DevExpress is the component vendor that has created a extra reports, and that's the one I would recommend if you would want to use client-side reporting. Um, server-side reporting, we recommend using SQL Server reporting services, which is also a free version of that as well. Um, in that case, you're do designing it through SQL Server, and you're just calling the reports um, f f via buttons on LightSwitch. Okay, so in the box, we do not have a report designer, but that is a common request, and it is on user voice, so please vote for it over there. 
Release date. I cannot tell you the release date. Otherwise, I would get fired. And if you're hiring Jose, maybe maybe I could tell you. But no, I I can't tell you what the release date is going to be. But um, we are we are on target. I can tell you that. Um, Oracle provider available. Yes, there are Oracle providers available. I forget. I think uh, who, if somebody knows who the Oracle provider is, what company it was, Data Direct. I believe it's Data Direct has an Oracle provider that you can you can grab from them. Um, that should work. I think that they had. I think they released that actually about last year. So, okay. Can you get copy paste objects within a project or between projects? I know exactly what you mean. All right. Um, that is a very high priority request on user voice. We've added it to our backlog. Um, that's not something we, that made it into this version. Um, basically, you. I understand that you want to not only copy full screens back and forth, but you also want to copy parts of the content trees back and forth, um, or import or export modules of data and screens together. Those are all something things that we're looking at for future release. Is Silverlight coming to Android? I probably not, but I'm not on the Silverlight team. I'm on the Light Switch team, so I'm probably not going to comment. Uh, I, I believe Silverlight is probably in, uh, it's got 10 years of support on its version 5, but version 5 is the last version as far as I know. Okay. All right, so any other questions? All right, so I hope I kind of, I know this is kind of quick, and you know, there's a lot of features in here, so I really encourage you to download the beta. Want the, the easy place to go, like I mentioned, is msdn.com slash lightswitch, um, and we've got a lot of beta resources out here. So here's the down, link to the download, um, and, you know, here's a list of all the features that I kind of went through all written down for you. There's the documentation. This is the beta forum, so as you're as you're working through your your apps inside of the, the Visual Studio 11. Make sure that you have, if you need troubleshooting or have problems, make sure you go into the forum. Um, there's a lot of folks in there to help you uh, troubleshoot. And we also want to know what's wrong because we're still trying, you know, we're still locking down, fixing bugs, and making sure this product's nice and shiny when it goes out the door. Okay, and here's, like I mentioned, here's the link to that Contoso construction sample. Okay, so, oh, one more question popped in. Let's see. Has there discussed on unbound data grid in the future? Um, I don't think so. We all of all of the stuff that the team team focuses on is around the data, is the bound data. You could create your own custom control to do stuff like this. Um, so I think we'll probably leave that for the extensibility side of the house. Um, and, but I, I kind of know what you mean. I mean, just un, having um, data or maybe even um, some projections of data, actually being able to put that inside of controls. We Right now, it would have to be a custom control. Okay, so um, I'm going to leave you with a couple additional resources here and uh, just one last point to make. Um, so Visual Studio Light Switch is really the simplest way to build business applications and data services for the desktop and the cloud. So if you're writing, if you're trying to write, um, you know, business rules around data and you want to expose that to multiple clients in your enterprise, then um, Light Switch is a great way to get started doing that. Okay, so here are your, uh, your more resources around the community. There's our blog URL again, and the Dev Center I went over. Um, face, we're on Facebook. Please like us. We need we need a lot of friends, and um, follow us on Twitter, VS Light Switch. Okay, so thank you very much.